Hello. Uh, well, this is us live now, guys. It's uh, seven o'clock. It's uh, Wednesday night. We're going to do our Bible study. Um, so if you come on, let me just hit this on myself. If you come on and if you can say hi, if you can do the usual stuff of like, share and comment. Hi, Renee. Um, guys, uh, if you're, if, hiya, hiya, mom. <laughs> hiya, Trevor. Guys, if you just come on, you say hi, you share where you are. We're going to go through Genesis 2, but we're going to look at certain things that, you know, like what we try and do with our Bible study is we try and see the application for modern times for where we are, specifically in these end times. So we're going to do that tonight. So if you take a second, just share where you are. I'm going to do the same myself. And don't forget to, to say hi, to like. Um, the more comments helps us get out there past the algorithm as well. So the more you talk, the more the easier it is for us. Hi, Simon. So we've got, let me see, Port Rush. We've got Belfast. We've got, um, I think Renee's in Texas at the minute. So we've got people from all over coming on. So guys, again, if you come on and you're coming on, on from anywhere around the world, just let us know. Um, let me just do this. Just take a second. Comment, share, like, same usual stuff. We take a second just to get a few people on and then we will crack in, um, crack on with Genesis 2. It's taken us three weeks to get to Genesis 2. Um, I'm not the fastest, that's all I can say. So, but we're going to look at something that I, I've, I've sort of studied before. Um, I think it's really interesting because I think it has um, a, a real message for us in these times. Your flower mound, Texas. Praise God. Um, I have no idea where that is, but <laughs> I've been to Texas once in my life, and that's it. Um, so, guys, if you come on, it, like the same as usual, just share, comment, like, and we will get started. Um, I think my screen has frozen on my end, but I'm just going to keep going. So, guys, if you have your Bibles, we're going to look at. Um, Genesis chapter two, and we're going to go from there, and we're going to look specifically, we're going to center around the four rivers today, and we're going to look hopefully at something, that, like I said, that I think is applicable for the time that we're living in, and if we're to call tonight anything, it would be to be sustained by the river, to be, to, to be empowered by the river, and let me just see if this works now. Okay, so if you've got your Bibles, we're going to look at... Genesis 2, chapter 9. I'm going to pray now. So, Father God, I just thank you for tonight. I ask, Lord, that you're the center of everything that we speak about, every revelation that uh, you impart, Lord. And I say, speak to your people right now, impart to their minds, their, their, their soul, their mind, their will, and their emotions, so that they are having that revelation and speak directly to their spirit. Let the Ruach HaKadosh the Holy Spirit commune with their spirit tonight. So revelation is personal and revelation is ready to empower the body for the time in which we live. Lord, we are living in unique times right now where the body has to be equipped and powered like never before. And I say right now that let tonight be one of those nights where people put on the armor, where people step into the war room, ready to declare victory in the battles that they face. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. We either need you all here or we need to come to Belfast. Um, yeah, I like, to, you know, Texas, here I come. But um, yeah, you're welcome here anytime, Renee. So, guys, we're going to look at this. If you're coming on, like I said, please take a second and just share. And I'm just going to crack on where we're at. So we finished Reveille, or sorry, we finished Genesis 1. And uh, we looked at a lot of different things from all of the Hebrew. We, we spent an awful lot of time in Genesis 1, verse 1. And we went over that, that, that uh, Bereshit bara Elohim. And we went through all of that. And we went through the numbers. And we went through all the systems and all the messages through Genesis 1. Now we go into Genesis 2. And yes, there is a little bit of repetition. But we're not going to focus on the repetition tonight. We're going to move a bit past that. I am, however, going to read this. Okay, so. Verse one, thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day and from all of his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it, he rested from all of his work, which God had created and made. This is the history. 
the his story, right? This is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day of the Lord God, that he made the earth and the heavens before any plant of the field was in the earth, before any herb of the field had grown, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain, and there was no man to till the ground. But a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man, verse 7, of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils of the breath of life and man became a living being. Now, one of the things, hi, April. One of the things that we pointed out in Genesis 1 is we went through some of the scientific elements uh, that you can see throughout scripture. i done this with my mentor group and I went through, you know, all the different um ways in which science is trying to catch up with what the bible says and one of those ways was that we have you know scientists have found now that there are 28 uh, carbon elements within the dust of the ground and those 28 elements are found in the makeup of man in the makeup of humanity so it just corroborates genesis 2 verse 7 that we are made and put together from the dust to the ground but what separates us from an inanimate object and from uh the animal kingdom is the fact that we have the spirit of life, the spirit of God breathed into us. We have the Ruach HaKadosh breathed into us that, that changes us, that makes us a tripartite being, that makes us a spirit man who has a mind, will, and emotions, a soul, right? In the Greek, it's a psyche, is, is uh, your soul, your mind, will, and your emotions, where we get psychology from. And it's pneuma in the Greek for the, the spirit, same like breath like you think pneumonia and it's it's that same sort of thing so spirit and soul are separated and then we have a flesh suit a body and i want to talk tonight as we go into verse eight about the provision that is made for us from god how he surrounds us with everything that we need how there is a prophetic message in the tale of the four rivers right and I want to look at that tonight. So if you have notepads, please gather them around and sort of write out, out what we're saying tonight and look into your own study. Remember, we, we hold true to Acts 17, 11, that you test everything that is said by a preacher. You know, I believe that, yes, we're given revelation here tonight, but the revelation that we're given should not substitute the revelation and the personal revelation that you get in your own private biblical study. So tune in on a Wednesday, great but it should be a daily walk. You should be so hungry for his presence that you don't want to just uh, rely on what anybody else gives you. But hopefully this will spark an interest off you that you can go and you can seek him even more. Hiya, Helen. So we're going to look at this, right? Verse eight, the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. Now straight away there, I want to differentiate. Hiya, Simon. So I want to differentiate that there is, when we talk about the garden of Eden, there's the Garden of Eden, but the Garden of Eden is not Eden, right? Eden is the, the bigger place, and the Garden of Eden was um, a plot, let's say, that was established and put together for, by God for man in the eastern part of Eden. Now, East has a, a, a meaning that, you know, a lot of people miss. In the original Hebrew, East is the word Kedem, okay? So you've got North, South, East, West. And they all obviously represent directions. But east isn't what we would normally uh, sort of see through our, our 21st century eyes, right? We would see east as being uh, left of, uh, so west is over here, east is over here, and north and south, that way. We would see it in that way. What are you talking on? I have just come online. Genesis 2, Simon, we're talking on Genesis 2. And we're talking about, um, we're in Genesis 2, verse 8. So the Garden of Eden is planted in the eastern part. And whenever you see east in the Bible, it also represents holiness, right? Now, Kedem, literally translated, has a meaning that that which lies before you. Now, I personally believe that there's a message in everything that God does. You know, nothing in this word is there by accident. And Everything and every action that he has taken from, you know, pre-creation, creation and throughout, that every action is purposed. And when we look at this, I believe that God was placing Adam and Eve, mankind, in the Garden of Eden, and he placed them in an eastern part because the message of the eastern, the Kedem, is that you look at that which lies before you. See, if you look at what God initially wanted, is that he wanted to commune with Adam. He wanted to walk in the garden with Adam, and there was a period in which he did so. There was a period in which he walked in the garden with Adam, and he communed with him daily. Now, I think that's amazing. 
Now, we live in a time now that we have been redeemed for that same promise that we don't need now a physical garden. We are redeemed in the process that we walk with God, yes, but we walk with God not as citizens of this earth, but as ambassadors of heaven on this earth. We walk with God, according to Psalm 23, through the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil. Why? Because he is with us. And this is one of the things that we need to get a hold of, right? We're not going back. We're not talking about focused on a literal um, Eden here. Right? Yes, there will come a time in New Jerusalem, but our Eden and where we're looking for, our prize, if you look at Hebrews 11, I think it's verse 13, is not here, but in heaven. We're looking forward. But in the process of our walk, we are walking, we are recommuning re with God because of the sacrifice of Jesus that we can walk daily with him. I had a conversation with my wife earlier and we were talking on the way home and I was coming home from work and we were just talking about healing and different things like that. And I had said, you know, what, my, what the church needs to do and what would be amazing for the church to waken up to is that we are not to be focused on going to God with petitions all the time. Now, yes, the Bible is very clear, make your petitions known before God. But that shouldn't be the purpose of seeking him. The more intimate a relationship is with Jesus, you don't just go to Jesus to get. You don't go to Jesus and treat him like a divine slot machine. That you put your prayer in and just get something back. You go to Jesus. And what happens when you're spending time in the secret place, in the war room of God? You spend so much time with him that you come away and you forget that you, you had a petition that you were bringing toward him because you get caught up in his majesty. Psalm 100 verse 4 says that we enter into his presence through praise and thanksgiving. I challenge you this. When you start praising and thanking him in a, a magnificent way, you start really praising him and thanking him for everything that he has done and everything that he will do. Then what happens is the petition that you had initially had on your mind, the need that you needed met, you forget about that because you're so in awe of his presence. And then that, that falls into Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of its righteousness. You don't seek the needs. It says all the needs will be added on to you, but you seek first the kingdom. And I said, see if, if we can get into a war room mentality, and I'll get to the scripture here in a second. This is relevant for what we're talking about. Then in these times right now, I personally believe you will not be shaken. You will not be moved. You will not be uh, persuaded by the Python spirit of the day. You will not be deceived by the whisper in your ear. You will not be taken off track. Why? Because you're so focused on his presence. And nor will you be this uh, type of believer that is just gimme, 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 gimme. That's a, that's a bill of lies. That, that's, that's a false gospel that we've been sold. That you go to God just because you treat God as a way of trade. Listen, there is one in the Bible who is who is, um, uh, who is equaled or, or talked about in the essence of trade. And his name is Lucifer. In Ezekiel, uh, Ezekiel 28, verse 16, it says that by the abundance of your trading, talking about Lucifer, violence was found in your heart. Now, that's talking about him. So what he does is he's looking for you to come, you know, gimme, gimme, gimme. Look for self. That's, that's, the, that's what Satan's looking for. God is saying, no, if you just spend time with me, if you spend time in the place that I have created for you, if you come into the war room, you will leave changed. You will come in going, God, I need this. God, I need provision. God, I need healing. God, I... But then you get caught up with his presence, that you go away and you're healed by consequence of being with him. Do you understand? There is not one person in the Bible who spent time with Jesus and who was in his company, who went away unchanged. There, in fact, even if you look at this, there's nobody who died in the presence of Jesus. When Jesus went to see Lazarus, I know I'm way off on the tangent, but it has a point. Please bear with me, because I believe this is relevant for this time. If you're coming on now, please share it. Please like it. Please comment, because I believe this is relevant for this time. Whenever you look at whenever Jesus came to, sit, to meet Lazarus, he had to wait four days. Why? Because he, Lazarus, I personally believe, could not have died when he was in the presence of Jesus. Whenever you're in the presence of Jesus, sickness, disease, and, and hurt, and pain, and depression, and lack, all of that loses its grip on you. And you become a believer, like James 4 verse 7 says, someone who can resist the devil and he will flee. 
because the devil can't grip onto you and come into that presence. And what we need to be is worshippers who want to bask in his presence, knowing that he is fully provided for us. And we're going to talk about the message of the four rivers in a second, but I want to explain to you, look, the, God is calling you right now into his war room. And when you leave his war room, you don't leave uh, depressed and downtrodden. You don't believe with a, a countenance face in the ground. You don't believe, uh, you don't, you just you don't leave going, oh, poor, woe is me. You leave charged up, ready to run for God, ready to go after and kick in the gates of hell with your boots. Now, this is what we need in this time right now. And I want you to understand, Eden, when we talk about East Kedem, God is saying to Adam and Eve, I have planted a garden, not in, not Eden. Eden, Eden is in the garden, I planted a garden in Eden, eastward. Why? Because I want you to look at that which lies, Kedem, that which lies before you, that I have provided for you in every way, that every day you wake up, you see, it's not stormy outside. You're not seeing wind and rain. What you're seeing is just the, the, the water, the mist hover over the land. And you hear me in the garden and you see me in the garden and you walk with me in the garden and you commune with me. In other words, there's nothing out there for you. It's all there for you in that, that secret place with God. If you look at East in the Bible, if you see it in a lot of different ways, Ezekiel 47 12, tells about the healing waters coming out of the temple. We're from the eastern, um, the eastern door to the temple. The entrance of the tabernacle was placed on the east. Jesus enters Jerusalem through the sheep gate, which is also the eastern gate. You see that whenever they left, um, when Adam and Eve sinned and fell and left the Garden of Eden, that God places a cherubim. At the, at the eastern part, at the eastern gate to the garden with a flaming sword. Why does he do that? Because he doesn't want anybody coming back in. If East, if, if, East, if Kedem represents holiness and sanctification, he doesn't want people trying to get in through their own effort. In other words, the only way they can get in is through the same representation of that cherubim at the eastern gate, the flaming sword of the spirit, which Ephesians 6 tells us is the word of God, representing Jesus Christ himself in John 1. Are we getting this? Guys, if you're getting this, hit one. Let me know that you're understanding what I'm saying here. I'm just talking. We're getting to, I want to lay a foundation here. Um, you see, the thing is, is that if they try and get into the Eastern Gate, if they try and, you know, when Adam and Eve were pushed out, the, the, the main issue there is that if they try to get back in through their own efforts, then they would be seen as self-righteous. No one is righteous apart from God. Righteousness cannot be attained. It can only be given. But at the same time, you have to understand that whenever they come in, if you look at the, what the Garden of Eden represents in the context of Eden, I believe there's a picture for you right now. If Eden were the whole of the church and the Garden of Eden were the remnant, the believers who truly followed the example of Christ, who picked up the cross and followed him, who were ready to go into every trial and tribulation and still experience joy. James 1 verse 3, experience joy and exude joy in the midst of tribulation. If that is you, then you're a Garden of Eden resident in that picture, in that metaphor. In the Eden picture, it represents the, the whole church. Now, not, Jesus says in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, what does that mean? In other words, you could, they, when they were cast out of the garden, they could still go into the land of Eden, but they weren't into the Garden of Eden. So whenever you look at this, you could still see that there's people who will, um, say, Lord, didn't I cast out demons in your name? Lord, didn't I uh, uh, heal the sick in your name? But if they weren't burying the cross of Jesus, if they weren't picking up, if they weren't solely wanting to spend time with him. Guys, I, I, I honestly, look, when we talk about healing, one of the biggest questions we get asked is why do some people experience healing and others don't? Now, we've experienced healing in massive ways, right? But why are some not getting their healing? And I'm saying because when it, it's not the, it's nobody's fault, it's nothing like that. It's because of how we've been sold it. We have been told, and I personally believe by a false gospel, that for you to get your healing, you have to do X, Y, and Z. That's not true. If you want your healing, you've got to sit at the feet of Jesus. If you want your healing, you've got to do that thing, which is needful. You've got to go into his presence. I'm not even talking going to church here, although I'm a big advocate for that as a pastor, but I'm uh, following Hebrews 10, 25, that we, um, 
as the day of the Lord approaches, do not forsake the gathering of the brethren. That's one side of things. But I'm not talking about going to church. You get your 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 talent, right? You get your prayer shawl. You get under your prayer shawl and you pray and you spend time just glorifying him. Honestly, glorifying him going, you know, when you really look at what he is and who he is and what he has done for you and what he will do. Like Revelation 12, 11 calls us overcomers. Oh, thank you, Jesus. We are overcomers, right? Revelation 3 says that the, the faithful church, the one church according to Revelation 3, 10, that are promised to miss the hour of the tribulation, the hour of the trial, they, they're called faithful. Why? Because they persevere and they overcome. And how do they overcome? Well, Revelation 12, 11 says that we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the power of, the power of our testimony. Amen? Oh, by the way, if you see Gary McKibben commenting, that is my wife on my Facebook, as opposed to me, right? Okay. So when you look at this, Ezekiel 11, verse 23, and let me just get, I'm going to get to my message, I promise, right? But bear with me on this. Ezekiel 11, verse 23. Throughout Ezekiel 11, it says that the glory of God sits in the eastern part of the temple. And then what happens? It lifts up from the temple and it goes to the east side of the mountain and it descends upon the east side of the mountain. Now, on December 21st, of 2021 i had a vision and it was a vision like uh yes it is you kelly <laughs> um, i had a vision that and it was like something that i never experienced before kelly's on here uh masquerading as me but she can tell you because in the middle of the night we were lying in bed and i was wide awake and but i didn't know i was talking i started to shout out and i started to dictate sort of like narrate what I was seeing. And I was seeing all of these things unfold. You've heard it before. Some of you have seen the artistry that we've had. We've had prophetic art done with it. I saw um, an hour glass change to a wine glass, new wine in the wine glass. And out of the side of the wine glass was a tree growing out of the stem, producing loads of fruit. Then the vision changed for me to be in a barren land and to look at, load at this tree that was completely devoid of life and dead and no fruit on it. And I heard uh, words that, you know, I started to dictate. And these words were along the lines of um, the, the, tower of, uh, the Tower of Babel is being exalted in the minds of men. And I talked about the deceiver. And then what happened in this is I was lifted. Like if you think of Ezekiel 8, and Ezekiel 8, by the way, fantastic vision. God doesn't lift Ezekiel nice and gentle. He grabs him by the hair and lifts him and puts him in Jerusalem. And... I was going to say your type is <laughs> very good, Trevor. Um, and he let, sets him down in Jerusalem. Well, I was set down on a mountain on the eastern side, and I was grabbing onto a rope, a tikva, right? The rope, the cord of hope. The, the, where there's Jesus. I was grabbing, and I was making my way up the mountain, and it was on the eastern side. I personally believe God is calling his church to holiness right now. He is calling his church back to a, an, a garden way of living a garden to them eastern way of living in the sense that we are wholly sanctified and drawn out from the world amen so let's get to the, what i'm trying to tell, talk about am i talking too fast yeah i probably am um right verse nine uh, and out of the ground the lord god made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden and from there it parted and became four river heads. What's four? Four is the number Dalet, right? Dalet, um, uh, I can't, I don't have a pen, sorry. Dalet, it's, it's kind of, if you can, it's like that, sort of. It look, it's, it's a door, right? And it represents a spiritual door. And whenever you see these, this one river become four, it is a spiritual door. And I believe there's a message in each of the names. And we're going to look at each of the names here. We're going to look at what each of the names mean and the prophetic message that it has. I can speak Kellish if you can speak. <laughs> Very good. Nobody, I don't know if you can speak Kellish. Um, I don't understand her, and I've been married to her for over 20 years. So, uh, 
Right, so river one, let's go to river one, right? The first river, the name of the first is Pishon. It is the one which skirts the whole land of Havala, where there is gold and the gold of that land is good. Now, what does Pishon mean? Well, Pishon basically translates as great diffusion or shaking. Now, you might get a bit, an inkling of what the prophetic message is in this chapter and how it relates to all the way through your Christian walk from the moment of, of salvation all the way through and how it relates to life, but also how it relates to these days. Great diffusion and shaking, right? And, and it, it comes from the, the, the broken down uh, of the, the syntax of the word. Sim is a region. The who is shake or trouble, passas is to break or scatter. So when you look at this, Pishon actually represents a, a, such a, a heavy shaking that scatters. Okay, now we see this throughout the Bible, that there are events that happen that shake the people and they scatter around. You see events that happen, like even if you go in and you, you, you go with um, what happened with the Babylonian captivity, you see what happens whenever you get to 70 AD and the diaspora happens in Israel and Israel is shaken through the volume of the temple and the destruction of the temple and they scatter. Scattering comes from shaking unless you're holding on to that which is eternal. Now Hebrews 12, 26 talks about a time on which there will be great shaking in the land. It talks about a time in which not only earth will be shaken, but heaven will be shaken. And it's telling, throughout the, to give you a paraphrase of the context of this, it tells you to let go of that which is temporary and hold on to that which is permanent. To hold on to that which will not be moved. And that which will not be moved will be God, is God. So if you picture that vision that I had of going up the mountain, there's, if you haven't heard the vision, there's an awful lot to it. But when you're holding on to God, and God represents Tikva, the hope of our salvation. He is the hope, right? And that hope uh, is a confident expectation. When we're holding on to that Tikva, it is a, a hope that does not disappoint. And we can't be shaken in that process. Now, listen, it goes on to the next one. So bear in mind, like, we're going to go through these, right? So Pishon is in the land of Havilah. Now, Havilah is the land, right? So there's a difference here. I want you to separate in your mind. There are four rivers and three lands mentioned in this scripture. So there's four, liver, four rivers four rivers, and three uh, areas of land that, that, skirt, that skirt around these rivers. So Pishon then has Havilah, and Havilah is a tent or living as a symbi symbiotic whole, and it's a people who faint and languish, a weak people, who grow weak under shaking. So you understand this, Pishon is skirting around this, and the actual land that it, it skirts around is talking about weakness, those who do not respond well to shaking, those who in the midst of shaking grow weak, they languish, they faint. Now, bear in mind, we're going on. I'll give you the full message as we get through this, right? So we go on to the next river. The name of the second river is Gihon. It is the one which goes around the whole land of Cush. Now, Gihon means to burst forth. It reminds me of John 4, 14, when Jesus says to the woman at the well, and she is, she's thirsting, and she's, you know, he says about, you know, give me a drink, and she says, Lord, you do not have a bucket to, in which to lower, and he says, I have a river, I have a water, a, a, a supply in which will be in, will end thirst, you'll never thirst again once you receive this. John 4, 14 talks about a river of bubbling waters that spring up within. This is similar to this, right? So that you see that in that context, it's the Holy Spirit. In that context, it's everlasting life. And in Gihon terms, it's, it's talking in the, the, the context of the land, but it says in the midst of shaking and tribulation and, and um, things happening in your life on a personal scale, but also in a prophetic outpouring. And when the, the world is unfolding on a prophetic time scale, a more deep time timescale, you see this shaking happening. And then in that midst, it is, there's a bursting forth that comes. There's a bursting forth of the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God refreshes. It's also the same word. Gihon is the same word for rebirth. You know, none shall be, not one person shall enter the kingdom of heaven unless he be rebirth, born again. So let's carry on with this, right? We'll get, we'll put the message together. So when we look at this, you've got Gihon, but you've got the land of Cush. Now, who was Cush? 
Kush was the father of a certain guy who uh, comes to light more in Genesis 11 than anywhere. He has mentioned previously, but has the guy Nimrod, right? The first antichrist type. Nimrod is the, the, the old him who rebels, right? He is the hunter who, it translates in our Bibles, the hunter before God, but it's not. In, in the original Hebrew, it is the hunter who rebels or stands against God. And Cush is the father of Nimrod. So you could say Cush is the father of rebellion. That's the way I look at it anyway, right? So let's carry on from here, right? So we got Gihon bursting forth, Cush, the land of, uh, the, the talking about the land of Cush, the father of rebellion. The name of the third river is Hedekel. Now it's also called the Tigris, right? But we'll take it in the context of the, the Hedekel. Now the Hedekel has a couple of different meanings. One, it is seen as representing both joy and gladness, but also it is, it is the depiction of a sharp pointed sword. Now, if you, are, if you know your scripture, you know that Ephesians 6 talks about the sword of the spirit, okay? And we know that the sword of the spirit, even in Revelation, uh, I think it's 16, it is a two-edged sword. It is sharp. We also know, according to scripture, it cuts between marrow, it cuts between soul and spirit, right? It discerns between your mind, will, and your emotions, and that which is divine. And what is the sword of the spirit? It is the word of God. Right. So when we look at Hedekel, the river, it is a sharp pointed sword. It is the sword of the spirit, but it is also gladness and joy. Now bear with me. This will all tie together, hopefully. Right. If you're getting this, if you're following along with me, hit one, let me know. Right. Then we go to our next one. So the name of, uh, oh, sorry, the third river, Hedekel, it is the one which goes towards the east of Assyria. Now, Assyria. What, what is Assyria, right? Assyria is known as the, the first world global dominating empire, right? Um, so the Assyria, the Assyrian Empire was massive and it was a, a global empire. Um, and it, it was very much dominated at the center as a one world system. And Assyria gets its name from Asher. A-S-H-U-R, the son of Shem. Asher's name or actually means one step. Okay? One step. We'll get to that in a minute. The fourth river, the Euphrates. Now, the fourth river, the Euphrates. Guys, if I'm losing you, please let me know. If you're getting what I'm saying, please hit one. So the Euphrates, beautiful uh, uh, name that it is, it actually means the good and fruitful one. It comes from the, the EU, which means good, and para, which is fruitful, the good and fruitful one. Now, the prophetic picture that we're seeing here, I think, is amazing. If you take just the four rivers, let's look at just the four rivers, because I personally believe God is saying to you, he, he takes the one river, now look at what River's really important prophetically. If we look at Psalm 1, it says that we're not to sit in the seat of the scornful. We're not to stand in the, the council, or we're not to be under the council of the ungodly, or stand in the, the way of the sinners. We are to be like a tree planted by the rivers of living waters who produce fruit in its season and whose leaves do not wither. And for the man who does that, he will prosper in everything, right? That's Psalm 1. If you look at Revelation 22, there's a river that comes out from the New Jerusalem. And as it comes out from the New Jerusalem, you have the tree of life on either side of the river producing fruit in every season. We as believers are meant to be sustained by the rivers of God. If you look at Ezekiel 47, whenever the, the, the man of God is drawn out he's drawn out into the river and he is drawn out the water comes up to his ankle then it comes up to his knees then it comes up to his waist and then it comes up to a point in which he can't he has to swim we are supposed to be sustained by the river now the land in the bible according to genesis 3 i know we haven't got there yet represents the part of the curse the land is cursed so when adam is cursed the land is cursed right? It is by the sweat of your brow, you, you know, it will, bur it will bur both uh, fruit and thorn, thickle and flower, it will bur both. So you're the, the land is cursed, it represents part of the curse. Now I believe there's a prophetic picture here, 
Okay. I believe that whenever you look at this, that the picture of the one river splits into four, because that four becomes a prophetic picture of every believer's life, what will happen in life, that in your life there will be shaking, there will be trial, there will be tribulation. And as there is tribulation, then in that midst, in the shaking, you have the choice. If you focus on God, if you stay in the garden, you are also sustained by the next river, the Gihon. And what will burst forth is the spirit of God. A rebirth will happen in you. You will become uh, fulfilled and uh, completely directed by the spirit of God. The Rak HaKadesh will be that which sustains you. The word, uh, the, then that will go on. So in the shaking of the rebirth, burst forth, from the sword of the spirit, the word to produce joy and gladness in your life, and which will produce good fruit. So Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the spirit. Remember, it will come a time in which you will be identified by if you're producing fruit, or a good tree produces good fruit, a bad tree produces bad fruit. So this, the message of this river, the prophetic message of this river, that if you do, you will always shaking will come to your door tribulation will come to your door now i'm a pre-trib rapture guy i believe that we will be out of here before the great tribulation the reason i believe that is because the great tribulation is also identified in jeremiah 30 verse 7 as jacob's trouble it is identified as directed and it is all about dealing with god's uh, our original covenant people israel we the church the restrainer of the uh, the lawless one, Second Thessalonians 2, will be gone for the lawless one, the Antichrist, to emerge. Now, does that mean that we miss all tribulation? No. I was talking to my good friend, uh, Apostle John Ward, last night. And if you're, by the way, there will be a video. We, we had an hour, of, well, we spoke for about two hours, but an hour and a half, but we'll be on tomorrow night and we cover everything, right? So it'll be on here at seven o'clock tomorrow night. But I was saying to him that a believer will experience the squeeze, right? You know, I personally believe we'll experience squeezes on all sides. We will experience a squeeze, just like a tube of toothpaste is being squeezed, just like the birth of the beginning of sorrows. It will be squeezed until the emergence of the lawless one, and then we will go. And then it will be God dealing with his covenant people, Israel. But until that time, we will experience Experience shaking, we will experience tribulation. 2020 has been a massive period of tribulation. 2021, people I remember were saying it's going to get better, it's going to get amazing, it's going all that's going, and we're going to go back to normal. And we didn't. And I, we prophesied that we wouldn't. We prophesied it would get darker. And 2022, I heard the same people saying, once you hit 2022, you're going to see a turnaround of circumstance. No, you're not. Because circumstance is not by which we live. We are called to live by faith, to walk by faith, not by sight. We are not to be moved by the squeeze. We are to produce fruit in the squeezing. When you squeeze an apple, apple juice comes out. When you squeeze an orange, orange juice out comes out. When you squeeze a Christian, the fruit of the Holy Spirit comes out. We are not to be worried about the circumstances. We are to be presence people who are focused on living in the the spiritual secret room the war room the spiritual garden of eden that whenever everything comes against us we know that we are sustained in the midst of the shaking that in the midst of the shaking god is bringing forth new life he is pruning us so that we produce more this is what it says in john 15 he produced for those who love him and, uh, and produce good fruit he will prune them and you think, well, that's not a great reward. You know, I'm producing fruit all right. I'm, I'm already producing fruit, God. Why are you, you clipping my branches? Well, he's clipping your branches so that you produce more fruit and that you can bear more fruit. And yes, it's the wine press, Renee. It is the wine press. Through that squeezing, we will produce more. And this is the point of the shaking. The shaking and God gives us the picture right back in the Garden of Eden. Remember, God did not cause the fall. But God is omniscient, he is omnipresent, he sees the beginning from the end, he is the author and the finisher of our faith, and as such, he, like a, like, a path, like forwarding through a, a, a film, he can see what the end is, he can see what the beginning is, and he knew that we were going to fall, so I believe there's a prophetic message here, when you're shaken, when the, the devil comes to sift you, like he did with Peter, when he comes to persecute you, when, when you see things rise against the Christendom, when you see things like in Canada, like the C4 bill that I've been talking about for about four weeks now, five weeks, when you see that, when you see that pressure come upon Christendom, that you can't 
that they're trying to censor the Christian in the public square. They're trying to censor the Christian in the pulpit. When you see that come, what should exude from you is not frustration. What should exude from you is not a, 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 a motivation to grow weary like Havila. Remember that the world will grow weary, weary in this time. Your, your job or what you should be producing is the fruit of the spirit. You should be going through that with joy in your heart, knowing that in every time you're persecuted, in every time tribulation hits your door or comes against you, that, oh, Wow, it's a chance to grow for God. It's a chance to bear more fruit because through your witness of bearing fruit, through your witness of going, you know, somebody has stolen from you. Well, I'm going to go out and I'm going to pray for them and I'm going to bless them and I'm going to tell them about Jesus. Serious? That's just mental. That's what the world thinks. But through the midst of your shaking and your tribulation, what the world will see is what you truly hold on to. Whenever the, the world looks at you and say, well, we, you know, someone's stolen from you. If you're holding on to your goods, you'll go after your goods and you'll beat that robber. Well, no, I trust what God says. Proverbs 6 says that, you know, when I catch the thief, when I identify the thief, he has to restore to me sevenfold. So I'm not going to worry about what he takes. I am going to stay going to praise God in the process. I'm going to do what Psalm 34 says. I'm going to bless the Lord at all times. Amen. So if you look at this, right, in the midst of the shaking, it is a chance. It is the opportunity for God to produce and to bring forth a new form of fruit and uh, a, a, a new production of fruit in your life. It is a chance for him to, to really show himself, to shine through you. And this will produce joy and gladness in your heart and you will produce good fruit. If you get this, if you agree with me, hit one. Hey, amen, if you, if you understand what I'm saying. And I want to go on and talk about what is the alternative to this, because it is seen in the, the names of the land. The names of the land show an alternative and show the, the strategy of the enemy. And God has forewarned us in every way, shape, and form that we do not be deceived, that we have no excuse for deception. So if you look at this, right? When we look at these lands, when we look at uh, Havila, when we look at... Um, Kush, and we look at Assyria. What do the lands mean? Remember, we said this before. So, in the midst of the shaking, that the shaking is constant to all. Righteous and unrighteous will both be shaken. Just because you're righteous, just because Jesus has covered you, doesn't mean that you still won't see the uh, the angel of death, like they did in Exodus, go across the tops of your houses. What keeps you safe is the fact that you stay in the presence of God, that you're covered by the presence of God. So in the midst of the shaking, you will all experience the shaking. You will all experience the, 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 the tribulation to an extent, right? But in the midst of the shaking, it says in the Havila, the people, the people of the world will grow weak. They will languish. They will faint under that pressure. It also says that they are a symbiotic, or a symbiotic whole. In other words, they will be of one mind. Now, that is reminiscent of what we see in Genesis 11. It says that they were of one mind. And the same as what we see in counter to that, according to the, the Christian faith of what the believer is supposed to be, that we are to be in the upper room of one mind. Listen, there's a battle. Do you get it? There's a battle over your soul, man, your mind, your will and your emotions. And that battle is constant. The enemy is trying to dictate to you how you should think, how you should direct your thoughts. And listen, you know. I spend a lot of times during the week counseling people who are experiencing different things from depression to anxiety to stress. And when we do that, it is all, you can, you can pretty much guarantee the same factors that have attributed to that. And when you look at that, it only takes a small tweak to turn their focus back upon Jesus. And when they turn their focus back upon Jesus, you can often see their countenance just change in an instant. And I want you to understand that at its core, there's a fight for your mind. That is where the battle is, okay? So when you look at this, under the shaking, the world will turn and they will languish, they will grow weak, but they will be of a symbiotic mind. They will be whole and then they will all be together in this. And this is our opportunity because if, they, if the world look upon the believer and see the believer producing fruit while going through the same thing, that's a witness. That's Isaiah 60. Arise and shine for your light has come. Darkness covers the land, deep darkness the people, but you, arise and shine why because that is the witness the witness is jesus being seen in you now when you carry on with this 
So Havila then goes to Kush. So those who follow into that symbiotic way of thinking, they become weak, they become languish, and they faint under the pressure of the world and under the shaking of the world. Something that I believe that we're seeing right now, something that will continue to happen and will get more and more and more. I personally believe 2022 and 2023 are key years. They're key, they're pivotal years. Uh, they're, we're in a Shemitah year at the minute, and I personally believe that you will see so much unfold. Now, I know that there's narratives changing, but if you go back, there was a, we done a wee small, we done a, a small uh, teaching, both Trevor, Simon, and myself, um, in January, and we done a nighttime teaching, and we done it on uh, the times that we're living in called Storms Arising. And in that, one of the things that I talked about was the WEF, the great narrative. The great narrative. This is something that is officially being launched by the World Economic Forum. And the World Economic Forum are launching a great narrative so that people are of one story. So in other words, they want to change a narrative so everybody sort of thinks and behaves the same way. This is their 2022 agenda toward the 2030 Great Reset. It's a pivotal year. There is a fight over your mind. There's a fight over how you think. Are you going to be off the land of Havila who are weak and faint under the pressure of the shaking? Or are you going to allow the shaking to produce something in you, a new dependence on God, a new leaning on Jesus, so that you do not depend on our reason on your own self, but in all your ways you acknowledge him? Now, when we see this, those who do grow weak and languish under the shaking, then you see the land of Cush. Then rebellion builds up. Because what tends to happen in life, those who are struggling, those who, are, who have went through a tribulation, and trial and tribulation comes to everyone, big, small, uh, old, young alike, it comes to everyone, right? But in the midst of the trial and tribulation, you have the opportunity to produce fruit or you have the opportunity to grow better. And when you grow better, you blame God. You, and you, you rebel against God. Don't believe me? Look at the book of Ruth. Right? Naomi, her name means beautiful. Whenever her husband, uh, Elimelech, whenever um, her sons, Malon and Chilion, die, she changed her name to Mara, which means bitterness. And we all have that. Now, the story, at the end of the story, there's a redemption in that, but we all have that. Through tribulation, we can grow in bitterness or we can start to produce fruit. And even more so in these days. Now, the land of Cush represents the land, the father of the land of rebellion. And I personally believe those who grow weak and do not rely on God in the midst of the shaking will enter in with symbiotically to one mind in the rebellion against God. And then what we see is they go into what? The next land mentioned is Assyria, which comes from the name Asher, which means one step. One step toward what? Well, Assyria is globalism. One step towards that global mindset. See this? So what you're seeing in Genesis chapter 2, from the four rivers, you see a mandate from God that in the midst of the shaking, you start to produce fruit, you start to lift up and depend on the sword of the spirit, and you be a good, fruitful one. But what you see also in the midst of that mandate is a warning of what will happen in the world. Those who do not depend and rely on God will falter, will grow weak, and will faint under the shaking. And as they faint under the shaking, bitterness and rebellion take root in their life. And then they are symbiotically of one mind, marched into a new narrative toward what Assyria represents, a one world mindset. Revelation 13. One world government, one world monetary system, one world religion. And this is the mindset that we're seeing being pushed. And I personally believe that if you just take these scriptures here, you're seeing it. And this, listen, you can do this all the way throughout the Bible because God, when he, when this word is ordained, it is God breathed. It is there for each and every man, for the reproof of man, for the correction of man, and to keep us aware of and not fall asleep or slumber in these times. We're to be awake to what's happening. And I personally believe that when we look at Genesis 2, God, the author and the finisher of our faith, him who is the Aleph and the Tav, the Alpha and the Omega, who moves the beginning from the end, he 
puts the message for anybody who has a heart to look for it and is hungry for his word to discern that, look, in the midst of tribulation, it's a chance to produce fruit. Or in the midst of tribulation, you can let bitterness take root. And if you let bitterness take root, then you're falling into the spirit of the age, the spirit of the world, the Ephesians 2, 2, small g, God of this world, Satan. And he will then dictate your thinking to bring you into a global mindset because Assyria was very much associated, the Assyrians were very much associated with slavery. And, and that's simply how uh, we see the Antichrist work. In Revelation 6, it says that he comes to conquer. The white horse rider comes to con conquering and to conquer. He doesn't conquer through uh, legitimate means. He conquers and enslaves. And that's what it's about. That's why we see in Revelation 13, the mark, where it is an enslavement. It is a one world mindset. It is a trapped way of thinking. You have a choice right now to think as the world thinks or to think according to scripture. If you're three parts being, if you're spirit, soul, and body, yeah, and your soul is here, and your mind, your will, and your emotions, right, your psyche, right, your spirit, your pneuma, or your rock uh, is here, right, and then your flesh, man, is here. Now, flesh, there's nothing good in the flesh, nothing good. The Bible tells us so. In fact, it says in 1 John 2, 16, that one of the ways in which the enemy works against us is through the lust of the flesh. He entices your flesh to sin. But the key battle is not in the spirit, because we know that according to Hebrews 10, 14, God has perfected upon salvation your spirit. He says, by one offering, he has perfected all those who are being sanctified. Right? So he's perfected what part of us? Our spirit part is the part that is sealed and perfected. But there's a process of sanctification, sanctification set apart for holiness. I am finishing, so just bear with me in this. Set apart for holiness. If you have any questions, put questions, uh, the word question in all caps, and I'll get to it. So the soul man, the mind, the will, and the emotions is that, uh, that thing in which the war is over, the battle is over. It's all directed into the mind, right? God is saying, look, if you renew your mind in line with the sword of the spirit and think according to the word of God. And every time you're shaken, you will start to produce fruit. But the enemy knows that if he can get you thinking differently, thinking according to the world, thinking according to his dictate, thinking of the, the symbiotic mind of a uh, one world th way of thinking that, you know, oh, it always happens to me. The way I should react is how the world reacts. Then. That's the way you go as a Christian, and you know you end up behaving just like the world behaves, reacting just like the world reacts, and you, there's no differentiation between you and the world. Guys, if you're getting this, if you've got something from this, please let me know, hit one. Um, if you've got a question, uh, again, just put question all in caps. Or if you've got something to say, say it below, and we'll get to it, and I'll go through a couple of comments in a minute. But I just wanted to give you a brief one tonight. I wanted to go through this. This is just the the, um, the four rivers, Pishon, Gihon, the uh, Hedekel, and the Euphrates. Whenever you look at those four rivers, you're meant to be uh, someone who is sustained by the river. Like I love Ezekiel 47 is the prophetic script, prophetic look at the the millennial temple so the temple of the new you know of the millennium of, of when jesus is ruling for a thousand years and in that you see healing coming out from that eastern gate and the healing comes out in the form of a river and that river then ends up just consuming the individual that the individual has to swim in that river do you understand that in the midst of all of the tribulation that you go through you can spend time with God. You can get into this word. You can spend time in here. And it just nourishes your soul. Whenever you spend time with God, you cannot go away the same way. And I, I challenge you right now. When you go to church, when you attend a church on a Sunday, or, or, or whenever you go to church, whenever you go to church, you should go out differently than how you came in. And that shouldn't be just a case of you getting saved and you go out saved. I mean, you should go out differently. Okay, you, there should be a pruning process in church. Church has become, because 
well, John and I were speaking about this yesterday, but church has become a place of numbers, right? It has all been numbers focused. So, and because it's been numbers focused, I personally believe the modern church is the epitome of compromise because the modern church right now has compromised in so many ways so that we can get bums on seats. Now, I'm not concerned about bums on seats. I'm concerned about soldiers. I'm concerned about warriors. I'm concerned about people who can take on hell, right? I'm concerned about people who can come in, get equipped, get discipled in the word of God, go out and change nations. That's what we're concerned about. You know, like, we got, we, yeah, I'm not even sure what, what size our church is, but I'm just saying, I'm not concerned. I don't count people going in. I don't count people in the service. I just personally believe that the church needs, listen, if one can chase a thousand and two can chase 10,000, how much can a hundred do? How much can 200 do? But it has to be, if it's a hundred people who are, you know, compromising on their walk, who are not producing fruit, who are not joyful in the midst of tribulation, then how do, uh, they're not doing anything. You're not actually taking on and you're not kingdom minded. When Jesus came, he preached the kingdom. And there is a war of the kingdom here, right? There's a war. We, listen, it's, it's, a, it's, it's imperative in each and every one of us that we are aggressive spiritually that we walk out in spiritual aggression, that we are not passive in our approach to our faith. Now, I'm not talking about being aggressive in the natural. I'm talking about spiritual aggression. The church are called to change the atmosphere. We're called in Matthew 10 to go and raise the dead, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, and cast out demons. We're called in Mark 16, to, when it says when we are uh, baptized and we believe, what follows belief and preaching the word of God is casting out demons. We should be going out and casting out demons everywhere. Now, I, we've seen so many cast out over the last you know, year. But I mean, literally, if you imagine a church of, say, 100 people going out and every one of them casting out demons. And listen, seeing people delivered, seeing people set free, seeing people receive Jesus and their lives being changed. How, how amazing is that? That's what it should be. I don't care where you are. I don't care if you're not with us geographically. You're called to this. You're go, called to go out right now and, and change the atmosphere. Get on the phone to someone who you know has not got Christ in their life or is maybe not walking with Christ in their life and just speak truth into them. Speak the word of God into them. Speak it into them and be a believer. Listen, time is short. And I've said this before, God's changed my life. Like I've saved, you know, over 20 years now. And but I, I had experiences with God that completely changed me. And one of the ones that really changed me was about three, four years ago, whenever I was walking and God showed me people in the street. And I just saw these people just walking down the street. And God showed me flames around these people. And when he showed me flames around these people, he spoke to my heart. They're on fire because I'm silent. They're on fire. They're going to hell because I'm too embarrassed or too, too busy or too distracted to go and to reach out to them. Guys, if we get serious about your faith, if you really get serious, it is not about uh, TV shows. It's not about televangelists. It's not about how big your Bible is. It is not about how big your, your ministry is. But every single one of you is called to ministry. When it says in Matthew 28, go ye therefore make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It does not say, only do that if you're a pastor. Only do that if you're an evangelist. It doesn't say it. It says, go you. You, you the reader, you who are born again, go you and do it. You're right, Trevor, 120 disciples changed the world. Those who stayed in the presence of God. That's what it's about. If you're spending time in the presence of God, and I know I'm going over, I'll have to go soon because I have to collect my daughter for work. But 
if you're if you're if the more you spend time in this presence, the more you walk out this atmosphere, you walk out this world, you walk out this living, that people go to you, what's different about you? Why are you not reacting the same way everybody else is reacting? Why, whenever persecution or tribulation is coming to your door, you're praising God and singing singing hymns louder and louder? Why, whenever you know you're you're you're, you're struggling financially, are you going out and blessing those who are stuck on worse condition than you? Because I trust my God. Because we live in the in the, the place of nourishment, we are we have a river inside of us that completely nourishes us continually. When Jesus was cornered by the disciples in John 4, after speaking to the women at the well, after he spoke to that woman, they said they went for food and they said, Lord, have you eaten? Or Lord, here, have some food. And he says, No, I have food of which not you do not know. In other words, he is nourished, and as he goes on to say, he is nourished by doing the will of God, by doing the will of the Father. Guys, do not worry if you do not start thinking to yourself you're not enough. Do not start thinking to yourself you're not uh, uh, versed enough in the Bible. Go out and share your testimony with someone. Go out, go to the go to the uh, petrol station, pay for someone's petrol. Go to the shop and pay for someone's shopping. Phone someone up that you know is suffering. Change them. Change the light. Be that atmosphere. Be the salt and the light of this world. For Jesus, be the restrainer of lawlessness. Don't be passive in your faith. Amen? Right, I could go on. and I, I'm not going to. So I don't see any uh, questions. If there's any questions, you can drop them to me. Um, but I don't see any right now. But guys, look, I personally believe that your call to, 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 to speak out, to preach out, to change this world. Listen, do not get caught and do not get distracted, right? Do not get distracted by the, the enemy. Do not get distracted by things in your own life, right? What do, what do little foxes do? Little foxes represent distraction in the Bible. Little foxes spoil the vine. Now, you're, you're part of the vine, right? Don't let the little foxes, don't let the distraction of life keep you from doing that which is needful and keep you from being in the war room with God. Amen. Father God, I just thank you for your people. Lord, I pray blessing over them. I pray strength into them. Lord, I ask that your Ruach HaKadosh just comes through them right now. Numa right through them right now. So tongues of fire upon them, breath into their lungs, so that when they speak, they speak not with worldly wisdom, not with worldly reasoning, but Lord, as your spirit dictates, as your spirit utters, they, that gives them utterance, that they have insight and revelation, divine uh, words of knowledge that they can speak into people's lives and see them change. Lord, I say that right now they are called for such a time as this. This is the time of the war room. This is the time in which the church stop being passive in their approach to, to the world and the spirit of this age, but start being aggressive spiritually. Start taking on hell, kicking the doors through, kicking the gates in, and realizing that no weapon formed against them shall prosper. Because Luke 10, 19 says that they have power over every single strategy of the enemy so right now let them be let them be warriors let them be special forces who go out with a motivation to change the atmosphere for jesus the motivation to go after the individual to see the individual saved to see the one who, who's just who's just needing to hear that hope needing to hear that promise and needing to hear about you just to see that one saved in jesus mighty name amen Guys, I call you the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. Kings, queens, and high priests in Jesus' name. More than conquerors, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. So when you go out tonight, today, tomorrow, wherever you are, I want you to go out with a new motivation to change the atmosphere for Jesus. To go out and go out. Do, take the example of Jesus. Go after the one. Don't settle. Go after that one and just... You know, have a heart for people. Have a heart that, that you don't want to see anybody burn. You don't want to see anybody fall by the wayside. You're ready to, to lay down your life for your brother. Amen. Guys, don't forget tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, um, you will see that, that there will be um, a chat. And we'll be talking everything from deliverance to church and all that. And it's uh, it's myself and it's Apostle John Ward. Um from north carolina originally from south africa but from north carolina um so if you if you're about seven o'clock 
um, tomorrow night. God bless. And I'll see, other than that, I'll see you on Sunday.